Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I am in search of a remote desktop application, and I think I found one. Let's take a look right after this. What do you think of when you're trying to access a machine remotely? Whether that be you're on the road and you're trying to access one of your home machines, maybe you're trying to listen to some music, or maybe you're trying to work on a video, or maybe you're just trying to uh, organize things while you're sitting in a hotel room with nothing else to do. But what if you're at home and you're sitting at a desktop and you're, you've got all these machines that you have to manage like those? <laughs> so what do you do? How do you get started with all of that? and make sure that you're accessing it. So uh, what I want, what I'm looking for, I don't know about you, but I want something easy. I want something that stays out of my way. I don't wanna to have to spend hours reconfigure it every time there's some update or some new, uh, new version of the desktop environment that comes out. I, I don't wanna be bothered with that. I don't want any configuration. I just want it to work. The other thing I want is I'd like to have end-to-end -end encryption, right? Because if I'm outside the home or outside my office, I don't really want anybody watching what I'm doing and seeing all the stuff, all my passwords as they're going over the network. So, yeah, I just want something simple. But more importantly is that sometimes I don't have access to my laptop, and I want my phone to be able to access those things too. So I... Maybe it's iOS, maybe it's Android, doesn't make any difference. I need to have access to that. So that's what I'm looking for. Is that too much to ask? Yeah, apparently I have tried everything. I mean, I, <laughs> we could go down through the list, but uh, yeah, I have tried it. I mean, you name it, I've tried it. And there's, there's all kinds of issues with them. Some of them have limitations on how long you can use them. Some of them have problems with handling certain desktop environments. Some support GNOME, some don't. Some support KDE, some don't. So you, and you just never know what you're going to get into. And some of them are so tightly wound into the operating system uh, that if you, try to, if you try to upgrade your operating system, all of a sudden your system breaks. Uh, maybe you're trying to access Windows. Maybe you're trying to access it from Windows. Maybe you're trying to access a Mac OS. Some of them do that, some of them don't. So it's, it's crazy. Uh, and, and the user interfaces on these things look like something out of the 70s. Uh, well, maybe not quite that far back, but maybe, maybe late 80s, maybe late 80s. They're, they're just ugly. And then when you get in, then there's the other problem. What happens if you have multiple screens on your machine that you're trying to access it? I don't know how many times uh, I have tried to use certain uh, remote desktop sharing, and instead of getting the option to look at one screen or the other, because maybe I'm only on a single screen, I get this. I get two screens slammed together that are so tiny, it takes a microscope to be able to read what's on the text. And trying to expand them, uh, it's just, it's a nightmare. Some of them don't work so well when you have a mouse. Some of the mouses, some of the uh, mouse actions, when you send, it's got to send that mouse uh, input to the Xorg server on your on your other machine. It has to move the mouse, update the display, which then gets sent back to you. And in that round trip, it can be up to 100 milliseconds sometimes before you see it. And that would be on a good day. So I don't know about you, but you know, you move the mouse and then. Oh, I missed the icon that to close the window. So I don't know how many times that's happened. It's just, it's just, well, in short, it's a train wreck. That's all there is to it. They're horrible. They're, they're just horrible. And it's hard to remember all the names. I mean, I think it's alphabet soup. We used to call it that uh, when you got in, you know, you got VNC, you got RDP, you got XRDP, you got our desktop, you got, you got any desk, you got spice. It's just, Okay, stop. You know, it's just ridiculous. So, yeah, choice. Choice of how many things you can use that don't work well. I'm going to talk about Rust Desk. No application is perfect, and you won't find one that is. So, I'm not whining. I'm just tired of all the garbage software that's out there purporting to help us. And some of it is built into the operating systems that we use. And it's just poorly designed. Some of it hasn't been updated in the last 20 years. So some of it has security issues. 
some of it doesn't even work through uh, your corporate proxy and firewalls. So, yeah, you got a real problem with some of that. So, Rust Desk. Let's talk about that. So, first of all, it is a, it is a, it is it allows me to access remote computers, and even in one case with Android, it allows me to access the screen on an Android phone. But iOS can be used as a client into other machines. So, yeah. And it works, of course, over a network, whether that be Wi-Fi, a LAN, over the Internet. Yeah, it, it, it works. The other thing is, is it's zero configuration. So why is that so hard? I mean, you got the configuration on the front side. You got the configuration on the back side. What's the problem? Well, some of them, uh, like for the Mac, for example, depend on X11 or Xorg for their uh, window manager. So that's a problem. That's a real problem because Apple hasn't used X11 in probably over 10 years, maybe longer. I don't remember when they got rid of Xorg, but it was a long time ago. So right away, you got to go install something. You got to go get some obsolete software called Xquartz to put on there to emulate an X11. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it, and that just makes things even worse, right? End-to-end -end encryption. Some of them say they do it. Some of them don't do it. Some of them don't do it well. Some of them encrypt the data stream, but they forget about the login, and so your user ID and passwords is exposed to the Internet. So, yeah, not, <laughs> not, not even a good thing. Some of them work pretty well. Uh, but if you want to access from Android or iOS, now all of a sudden you start narrowing way down. And in fact, for the longest time, the only way I could do it from iOS reliably was, or even Xor, uh, excuse me, even uh, Android, was to use uh, a command line through SSH. Terminus was one of the applications I've used in the past. It's a great app, but it's only text. If you've got things you need to do with the graphical user interface, you're out of luck because yeah, it won't, it doesn't work. So. What are some of the, some of the things that I like about about Rust Desktop? With the latest version of Rust Desk, that's version one one nine at the time that I'm making this video, if you have the Android client, you can enable it. It is not enabled by default, but you can enable it so that another uh, Rust Desktop client could access the screen on your phone. Uh, Mouse movements, uh, this probably is not world, world, world shaking because I think a number of applications already do this. But your mouse movements can be controlled either by a local mouse, if you're on a desktop or whatever, or a trackpad. They can also be done with a touch. So uh, it does support that as well. So if you're using this from iOS or from Android, you don't have to have a mouse sticking off the side of your phone or your tablet in order to do it. Also, during your session, you can do file transfer. Well, that's kind of nice because then you can move links, you can move documents or photos, whatever that you need from one device to another. So the other thing is that there are wide, it, it does have wide support for operating systems. So you don't need this application like X2Go, for example, to pick on them. You don't need this application to handle anything it does, XFCE and, L, and, LX, and LXQT, but it won't do GNOME, and it barely does KDE. So if, you, if you're using something like that, then you're going to have to have something else. So now you got to have another de remote desktop to be able to handle those situations. So you don't need that. Uh, it, so you, it handles Android, iOS, Linux, uh, Mac OS, and Windows. So you don't need a separate app to handle all that. Um, the other one is that it does have SOX 5 support, so if your systems that you want are behind a proxy firewall, uh, you can use SOX 5 in order to uh, gain access. It would be nice if at some point they move these protocols into, four, four, into the SSL 443 or 80 uh, because those, they, are, they don't block those in a corporate environment. So usually they don't because people need access to the websites <laughs> on the outside. Some of the cons are is... And these are minor. None of these are big deals. But uh, it'd be nice if iOS supported access to the screen. Because right now, there's only a couple of ways that you could, I can, uh, record a screenshot or a screen video 
from my iOS device. I could record it locally and then upload it, or I can use an Apple TV to do that. But it, yeah, so yeah, you could do that. Uh, the other one is that uh, only Linux x86-64 architectures are supported. I, I did try to get it compiled on ARM64. Currently, the only ARM device that's supported is Raspberry Pi. And they do have a package, a binary package available for that. But as far as other ARM devices like Odroid or something like that, yeah, there's no support for it. So I took the source code, I downloaded it, went through the process of installing uh, and compiling uh, the, uh, the source code and got all the way, I'd started with Asahi on the Mac uh, M1 chip thinking, all right, we'll start here. Yes, there is a package that's out in um, the a AUR, but that's the one I used, and that has an issue because you'll get through the compile, and just as you're starting to build the final binary, it blows up and says, sorry, we don't support this uh, architecture. So it would have been nice to know that up before it started through all wasting my time and doing the compile, but be that as it may, that's the way it is. I also tried just doing a native compile actually on an ARM machine using one of the Odroid M1s, and it failed as well. Same issue, uh, same message. So ARM64 uh, definitely not supported. Uh, sometimes on the Mac, audio is not supported. Now, I didn't have any problems when I was uh, accessing a Linux box from the Mac side. No problems at all. Audio came through just fine, and I could hear it just fine. It was only when I was using a Mac to talk to another Mac device. I haven't tried Windows. I don't know. But uh, uh, for the Mac to Mac, it's, it, didn't, it didn't produce any audio. Could be that it just wasn't looking at the right audio output because obviously it works on the client side, but it might be on the relay side that it isn't working. Some, a minor complaint is that when you create your... When you install it, it creates a default session ID and a password so that you use that in order for other users to access your machine. You have to have the session ID, which is a, a nine character, nine numeric character uh, setting that points to your machine. And then there is a password associated with it that you have to put in in order to make the connection. So that password string is a little bit on the weak side. You can change it, so it's not a big deal, but I wouldn't leave it that way if it was something I was using over the internet. So unless you wanted people to get access to your home machine. Also using Wi-Fi, uh, of course, this is kind of a no brainer, but I am using Wi-Fi 6 and there was some latency. I did notice about 100, up to 100 milliseconds, not always, but up to about 100 milliseconds latency with moving the mouse. But I didn't notice any of that latency on a normal LAN, on a one gig network. And of course, I didn't notice anything at all on, on the uh, high, higher speed side of the network here. So my, my take, Raspberry Pis work, uh, I have not tested it, but they do have the binaries for that. I don't have any Raspberry Pis that are currently running the desktop environment for Pis. They're all running as servers. And so I have stripped all that down. Uh, overall, the performance of the system is good. I mean. As long as you're not on Wi-Fi, <laughs> the system, the performance is pretty good. Uh, mouse movements are smooth, they're predictable, they're quick, uh, and so however they're doing that to get, you know, the they do have to send the information up to the machine and then and then send back the uh, cursor position to the uh, the client. But it works pretty well. Whatever they're doing, it works very good. Rust does not require any setup by default unless you have special needs like you're configuring in a local a local relay, then yeah, you would have to configure that in. iOS and Android, simple to set up. You can save those connections either in your favorites or you can create sessions for those. Uh, the overall design of Rust Desktop is great. I mean, the reason for that is they're using Flutter. And so Flutter, if you saw my videos on it in the past, Flutter is a technology that allows a developer to keep the same user experience from one device to the next. So if they develop this on Linux and use Flutter, then that UI can easily be moved without modification to screen sizes that fit a cell phone or screen sizes that fit 
a large desktop or ones that fit a tablet. And so you don't have to redesign and make it look completely different in order for it to fit uh, whatever architecture and device you're running on. So I really like that about Flutter. And I think there's going to be a lot more apps that are using that. So that's basically my comments on it. I have been using it for about 10 days. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, like I said, it works great over the LAN. Wi-Fi, eh, not so good. But that would be that would be pretty that would be pretty common. Uh, I have not tried it outside the home. Have not tried it over the internet. But I would suspect that in my case it would be fine because uh, my internet speed is about the same as a one gig network. So yeah, I wouldn't expect to see it be too bad at all. I don't notice the uh, encryption uh, delays or anything like that where it encrypts and decrypts. One thing I will notice, I will tell you, though, that be careful if you are install, installing the local relay. There's two pieces to that. Uh, but if you're installing the local relay, don't skip the step to put in a key. Uh, that key is important because that's the key that's used to encrypt the end-to-end -end, uh, on your, your local relay. So if you leave it off, you don't get the encryption. <laughs> It'll set everything in the clear. So... And then it'll automatically choose what it thinks is the best one for your operating system. So this is 119. And we'll go ahead and download it. And then I'll go ahead and open the DMG and copy it to my applications folder. It's right here. I'll go ahead and open it. And it says, you know, it is it is not in the Apple uh, store, so the Mac the Mac store, so. It's going to give me a warning about running it. And then you'll notice that there's this permissions. It says in order to access the remote desktop, you need to start with to allow screen rec recording permissions. So we'll go ahead and we'll configure that. Quit and reopen the app. <clears throat> And it comes back with another one. This time it's talking about accessibility, so we'll configure that. And then it says, great, now you need to install a system service to allow this to work on re And that's it. And you'll notice that it generates this ID. That's for this local machine. And then it will also create a six-character password. So, and this is what others would use in order to get access to the machine. So, I have a um, virtual machine open, and this is Ubuntu 2204 1, I think it is. So, we'll go up to the website again. This time it sees that I'm on Ubuntu, and so we'll download that. And I have it, so I need to open this up, and so then I can right-click on it and open with another application, which is the software installer. Okay, it's installed. So I should just be able to go to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and add that to my favorites over here, and then we'll launch it. And you'll notice that there wasn't any configuration to do here, but I had done that previously uh, before we even started, and that was to do this. I'll show you. So you edit custom config, and in there, there is a line that is commented out, which is this one right here, under daemon. And it says, Wayland enable equal false. And, and that's all you need to do. And then that, you'll need to log out, log back in, and then you'll be on X11 org. And that's all you need to do there. Um, so again, it has generated an ID, and it also has given me a password here. So I'm going to, I've got the remote ID and it's, and I'm, then I'm going to hit the connect button and then it should prompt me for a password and then I'll need to put that in and that's the one that I got on Ubuntu. So, and there we go. 
So I'm now connected to the remote desktop and all of this is coming through as if, uh, yeah, it, this is not using Spice. It's using the internal protocols of Rust Desk. So yeah, uh, it's completely free of that. It's actually communicating to the service. So you can see that it, as I'm typing, it's fairly responsive. Just as if I was sitting at it. Now this is, this is operating over a one gig network. And you can, you'll probably notice that there is a little bit of blurriness to this. Uh, you can clean that up a bit by going to optimized reaction time. So if you are seeing some lag, you can, you can increase the amount of bandwidth that's being used. There's also, if you want balanced, you can do that too. I think that's the default normally. So let's see. So I'm about 1.2 gig right now, and of that, Rust is taking, looks like 190 meg, it's right here. Two gig virtually, a virtual memory, but of course none of, all of that is not resident. And it's using about 4%, because this is sending, basically it's sending video, right, down the pike that's encrypted. So everything that I'm sending back has to be decrypted and everything it's sending down has to be encrypted. And then my client decrypts it for the display. So let's take a look at glances. 1.5 gigabyte of memory in use. Now, if you've seen my videos on this particular version of Ubuntu 2204, it uses quite a bit of memory anyway. So, so all right, so let's go ahead and launch it. You'll notice that the only thing it comes up with on this one is it just has the remote ID. And then it brings up the keyboard. So let me put that in. And then it should come back and ask me for the password. And there it is. My cursor is being moved by my finger. And you'll notice that, yeah, I, I can scroll it across. Uh, and so, yeah, down here you have a few things that you can choose from. Like I can pick up a, uh, a keyboard if I need it. I can also... I can also do things like I need to shrink the screen to fit which helps because now I don't have to scroll the screen around. Mouse mode should be, yeah, it's in touch. Okay, and then we'll bring up the keyboard and we'll type in. And you'll notice there is some lag here, and that is happening because the fact that it's communicating over Wi-Fi. So it does work, and this would allow me to be able to monitor and see what's going on in the system, do updates on it, fix problems that have occurred or whatnot. Uh, this over here is, this over here where I have my cursor sitting, uh, is the control panel on Ubuntu. And one of the things that this does, I don't know if, if this will allow me to disconnect the session from here. No. So I can't disconnect the session from here. That is for the user on the other side. So if you were using this as a help mechanism and maybe that person was worried about what you were doing, they can kill, they can kill the session. 
There's some other things here too um, that you can do, like refresh, refresh the page. And it says, you sure you want to close the connection? And you'll say yes. And then you'll notice that it saves it. So I still have to have the password to log in. So that's all I had for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again soon. Bye for now.